everybody. My name is Jed Derryberry, and I'm so excited to be one of the keynote speakers for Instoy's fabulous conference this summer in Denver. We hope that you'll join us. And my friend Sophia is joining me today. We're just going to have a little conversation about who we are and what we do. Um, as I mentioned, my last name is Derryberry, and I, you'll see my tag, my handle there, Mr. Derryberry on the screen. I've been an educator since 2001. I've taught elementary. I currently work in higher ed where I teach children's literature and fine arts for the elementary classroom. And then, I, and then I'm an author of three books, The Playful Classroom, The Courageous Classroom, and The Playful Life. And I also have my really uh, fun Etsy shop called Jed Creates, where I put my artwork out in the world and share it, share it with everybody. So you can check me out there. Sophia, tell everybody about who you are. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sophia Gonzalez. I come from uh, Chi-Town, uh, City of Chicago. I am a 15-year veteran in the secondary high school classroom. I am a traveling keynote speaker, and I am an EDU activist. Um, I'm really excited uh, to keynote for this conference and to be in conversation. I'm really excited about the issues that are ever uh, front and center in the world of education, and I'm just here for the kids, right? Um, I do have a manuscript that I'm working on, so I'm glad that there's an author in the house um, and <laughs> we could maybe talk a little bit about being a writer and what that looks like. Um, but I'm excited to get to know you, Jed. Yeah. So, Sophia, if you wanted to tell the world like one thing about your work and and your in your manuscript, you mentioned your manuscript. If you want to tell the world that that, that watches our our chat today, one thing about you and what you do and what, what would it be? Man, um, that's a pretty loaded question. <laughs> and I, I unpack that in a lot of different ways. Um, I'll start here where I usually start. I started my teaching journey in 2009 in a gang infested neighborhood within the city of Chicago. And it was there that, I really learned what it was to be a teacher in urban education. It was like a baptism by fire. It was cinematic. It was freedom rider stand and deliver kind of situation. The school that I was in was a check in, a second chance charter for students who were either kicked out or dropped out of the Chicago public school system. And so their last chance was with this charter school network that I was a part of. And my students were aging out at like 21 years old. And some of them were coming in with two credits, three credits, no credits. And my second year teaching in that campus, I started losing my students to gang and to gun violence. I, I saw the school to prison pipeline just flush right out in front of me, undercover cops coming into my classroom and yanking my students out during six periods. English because they were part of some type of an investigation the night before. And I remember Jed uh, losing my first student to gang violence. And I remember that funeral very clearly. It was the fall of 2012. And I remember meeting his mother in the parking lot and we exchanged, you know, um, thoughts and, and sentiments. And I gave her my condolences and she started crying and I said something to her that became the central theme of my life. I said, I'm going to do something about this. I don't know what, and I don't know how, but I'm going to do something about this with my hands, with my heart, and with this classroom mm -hmm. of mine. And it's been over a decade later, and I have not broken my promise. And it was there as a Latina, you know, that really saw like racial injustice and just the disparities in working with some of our nation's most vulnerable youth. And I realized in that parking lot of the Catholic church that I needed to become more than just a teacher. And it was in mm -hmm. that moment that I felt like I was like literally anointed to become this education advocate, disruptor, mm -hmm. interrupter, mm -hmm. and champion for marginalized and underserved groups of kids. And um, to me, like, that's what I'm kind of known by. Um, it's just really a champion um, for urban education and for underserved, you know, uh, student demographics. Um, and so now I'm in my home district because uh, I did five years inner city Chicago and it got increasingly dangerous for me. Um, I was just in some really dangerous areas and it was really starting 
to impact my mental health. Mm -hmm. And so I came home to my home community, but it's just outside of Chicago and it's still suburban urban. I'm title one. Um, most of my students are first gen from Mexico. And so this is personal to me. Um, and so I'm working really hard at trying to close those opportunity gaps. I'm working really hard to combat you know, systemic racism, language injustice, and mm -hmm. just really trying to break down these barriers that would otherwise hinder our students to succeed in life, myself included. Um, so those are some of the things that I've been really busy with. Uh, mm -hmm. Teacher trauma is something that I'm really passionate about. I don't think we talk about it enough. Yeah. Um, someone who's been really proximate to those issues, like strong, heavy issues, like no registered address, like student murders, like, mm -hmm. you know, a school to prison, like these are not light issues. Um, no. been so proximate to them that I feel like, man, I need to invade power spaces and I need to tell the lived experience of both myself as an urban educator and the students and families that I serve. Wow. You First of all, I want to say a couple of things to you as as your colleague in the profession. Number one, I, I send you condolences for that loss. Um, it was 12 years ago, but that grief is something that doesn't go away. And so, you know, a lot of times we send condolences the moment, the weeks after it's been 12 years, and I'm still sending you those condolences in our talk, you know, because I can feel that grief. It's still heavy, you know, and I think that what you are doing to bring that to bring that grief out more in this work is just such a noble endeavor you know listening to you talk about what you're you're doing I mean it's I feel your passion that's the second thing I want to say I just feel your passion for this work through this I want to tell everybody out there who's watching this you and I have never met this is a first meeting literally people are seeing our first meeting happen right here and when Instoy reached out and said, we want you to have a chat and you're going to have a chat with this uh, lady, you don't even know who she is. And I will tell you, they wanted us, I think they wanted us to research each other. I did not research you because I wanted to have this moment raw, unfiltered, where I learned about you and your work. And I'm just in awe that you and I are going to be a part of the same event in a leadership capacity as keynotes. And just, I, I'm so excited to meet you in person and to hear more of your story and and learn about just the amazing work that you're doing. It sounds fantastic to me. And third thing I want to say to you is thank you for what you're doing for the profession and and for most importantly for those students, you know, that you are encountering every single day. Um, and thank you for recognizing the trauma that teachers are are facing. Um, my second book, The Courageous Classroom, we wrote a lot about that. In my work, mm -hmm. I um I, I have encountered lots of teachers who are traumatized by the work that they are doing, but also they're bringing their own personal life trauma from maybe they've been in domestic violence relationships, they've been abused as children or teenagers or, or sexually assaulted or spiritual abuse. Another thing that we don't talk about a lot of times, I, I'm, a, I'm a member of the LGBTQ community and grew up in the South, and there's lots of a spiritual abuse that go on here. And and educators, we have all that real life trauma that we then go into those classrooms and have student trauma that we're trying to help them process while we are also processing our own trauma. So thank you for bringing that up. I think that's such a powerful topic that um, we need to talk about in our work. And the more that we normalize those discussions, I think we norm we lessen the taboo of it. You know, a lot of people feel like, Talking about those things is a taboo subject, but the more we talk about it, the more power we gain back. And what, you know, you, you said something else too I wanted to ask you about. You talked about language, um, what you said, language, uh, diversity, not language diversity. You said something, language, um, discrimination, not language. Language and justice. Mm -hmm. Language and justice. Yeah, that was a term I have not heard before. Um, mm -hmm. Can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, for sure. So, um, you know, because I was in and still am in some really high needs and high stakes school buildings, mm -hmm. I had, you know, really needed to make a decision to um, do I want to leave the profession, which I think is very common for a lot of educators um, that are really putting their heart into this work. Or do I want to seek specialized support 
um, that would help me to sustain the kind of work that I'm doing. So I'm getting to your question, but I need to yeah. mention this before I yeah. get to that. You gotta just, set it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like setting it up, Jay. I'm setting it up. I'm going to get to your <laughs> question. Um, so I started to seek out like fellowship network and fellowship opportunities and affinity spaces as a Latina that's bilingual, bicultural, urban educator, Chicago born, daughter of immigrants, I really needed, you know, a safe space that would, that would catch me, right? Mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. would affirm me and that would truly see me and the work that I'm trying to do. And so I started joining these national fellowships. The first one that I came up on was an organization called Latinos for Education. Mm -hmm. And I just recently came from California. I was at the, um, the let, let's see, the ASU plus GSV summit in San Diego, California. And I sat on a panel with them talking about educator diversity and the presence of the Latino educator, et cetera. But when I entered this Latinos for Education Fellowship in 2022, they said something to me that changed me from the inside out. And they told me, Jed, they said, we want you to know in this fellowship that you are your ancestors' wildest dreams. Wow. And, I, and, and we want you to lead from your identity, mm -hmm. your cultural identity. I had never heard that before in my life. I'm like, what? I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. Like, that is yeah. so dope, right? Like, yeah. and it's just like, liberated me um, to really amplify the cultural identity that I had as an educator. And as a result, it opened up a new lens and I went to another dimension of advocacy. Yeah. And that's where the language justice piece comes in. As I mentioned, at the building level where I'm at currently, uh, it's Title I, first gen, almost 100% Latino students. Um, and I'm dealing with, and we're working with a huge influx of newcomers and multilingual learners. And I teach junior AP language and composition. And for three years in a row, I was getting a full rosters of multilingual learners. And I realized just a lot of the disparities and the injustices and the unlearning that I had to help my students circumnavigate once they stepped into my door. I mean, representation was like, priority for me representation in the room starting with the flags like I'm half Mexican half Puerto Rican I call myself a Mexican Rican and mm -hmm. most of my students are from Mexico so they saw their Mexican flag there they were like yo like what's up like I could feel like I could I could totally dig this vibe um playing Spanish music um showing them their freedom fighters like Cesar Chavez Dolores Huerta who I just recently met man you manifest this stuff um, and just letting them know, like, raise your hand if y'all could speak perfect Spanish as you're learning English. They all raise their hand. And I'm like, that is a superpower. That is not a deficit. That is an asset. And that is not the narrative that many of our nation's kids have been told. And so when I talk about language justice, I'm talking about changing the narrative. Our U.S. Secretary of Education, Miguel Cardona, he's from Puerto Rico. He's a fellow Boricua. And so I'm just championing and just like leveraging the message that's coming from the Department of Education, that bilingualism is our what? Our superpower. superpower. And these are messages, Jed, that a lot of our kids have never heard before. The narrative has been for many eras. We yeah. speak English here, right? And yeah. so... These are some of the narratives and the messaging that I want to combat and that I want to reverse. So rather than saying ESL students, we're, we're moving away from that, right? And we're saying EL students, English language learners or multilingual learners, more from an asset framework instead of a deficit mindset. So that's what I mean by language injustice that I am trying to combat. Um, and obviously there's many languages that our multilingual learners represent in our nation schools, uh, but it is um, well over 60, 70% of our multilingual learners nationwide um, that are of Spanish descent. And so I feel a social responsibility. Um, I feel a personal responsibility mm -hmm. um, to continue to amplify those issues as a Mexican. rican yeah. You said something that I... I love, and it is really the heart of my work, um, is changing the narrative. Mm. 
Um, we've been taught our whole lives that this is the way, the path, and there's not a different one. And if you deviate from that, sometimes it's not the the way we should do it. And changing yeah. the narrative of people's understanding, like on on those topics, is so important to me. Um, not that it's anywhere close to probably what you deal with or what your students deal with specifically in regards to um, being put in classes, you know, for ESL, ELL, whatever you know that we call call it at the time. But one of the things I've experienced in my work, specifically when I get into academic areas, when people hear my voice, my natural voice, that the way I was raised, the way I was developed, I, I'm from the South. You know, uh -huh. I have a Southern accent and they bring all these stereotypes into the presence of whatever I'm teaching, whatever I'm doing, especially when I'm on the national stage. Recently, Sophia, I was at a, at a school in Minnesota where I could not get through the presentation because grown adults were laughing at my Southern accent. Yeah, they were laughing at my Southern accent. They were laughing at words that I was using that um, they didn't understand. Just, just silly things like, you know, in certain regions of the country, they call the the contraption at the grocery store that you push to get your 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 groceries. They call it a cart. But where I'm at, we call it a buggy. And so when mm -hmm. I am doing my presentation, I speak with my natural voice. I don't I don't do a lot of code switching anymore because I want to be my authentic self, right? Mm -hmm. And also, um, as a gay man, sometimes I might have a little extra sass in my voice, hey, <laughs> you know? I'm here for uh, it. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes that Southern and that sass go together. And I, I you know, I'm not going to change who I am. Good. I want to change the narrative of how you think about me that's what I want to change the narrative of how you think about me because you know out in the world you know oftentimes when people hear my southern voice they think that I'm not educated that I must be from the backwoods that I'm not um intelligent on the topics that they're intelligent on they make political assumptions about me and things like that because of where I grew up and and I love the idea of changing the narrative of flipping the script of of that language justice Mm -hmm. that you talk about that's a new word for me in this conversation and i'm going to take that and just take it use that yeah in my work because in my work my goal is three things always to equip encourage and empower equip people with new ideas and new way of thinking encourage because lord knows our work sophia is exhausting yes. it's exhausting and we need something to uplift us yes. and empower us empower others to take what we talk about and you know, use that to make a difference in the world. I have a tattoo on my arm. I don't know if you can see it on here, but it says, can you read what it says? It says, make a mark. Um, yes. Yeah. And it, it comes from um, a children's picture book written by Peter Reynolds mm -hmm. uh, called The Dot. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it, it's a fantastic book. And in the book, he said, uh, the main character's uh, teacher, the main character's name, Vashti, but her teacher looks at her and says, make a mark and see where it takes you. Wow. And when I think about what you're doing and what I'm doing about all the teachers that are going to be watching this are doing, we're making marks every single day. Yes. And we're just going to see where it takes us. You're making so many marks. Um, I, 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 there's no idea where this is going to take you. I can't wait to see where your manuscript goes, where your keynote goes, where the keynote that I'm going to do for so I mean, but all the work that we do, every single little thing that we do makes a mark. Um, and, and who knows where it's going to take us. I'm, I'm so excited to see how that's going to play out for, for both of us and for all the teachers that are part of this network. Yeah. I'm really excited just to see it all flesh out and just to be in a like-minded space. Mm. Um, that just really brings me to life when I have a bunch of like-minded around me, like that sets it off for me. But I do have a question for you. Um, you know, you focus on this idea of play and education, mm -hmm. right. As well. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Can you unpack that? Because I'm on the other end. I'm like drama. I'm yes. like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm funny. Like, I'm, yeah. you know, I bring comedy, humor. Yes, right. Switch, but I'm so, really like, you know, on the serious end. And so, play is important. Tell, tell us. You, about you that. said, you said something that's so key. You said that you're funny and you like to have fun and, and Joker kind of. So guess what? There are eight different play personalities that we have 
um, found out about through our research with, um, we, we did a lot, dug into a lot of research of Dr. Stuart Brown, who is America's leading play researcher. And he's identified eight play personalities and we write about them in the book. And they, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to try to say them all off the top of my head. I, I hope I can do it. Okay, okay. so you got the um, storyteller. Yes. You got the, the artist, cre yeah, I can tell. I can tell you're definitely a storyteller. Artist creator. You have the um, collector. You have the competitor. You have a word that Stuart Brown made up called kinesthete, the person who likes to move, okay? Not, the, not to be confused with the competitor. The competitor likes to move and win, the kinesthete just likes to be somebody that's up and moving. I don't know if you can yeah. tell. I'm standing up. up. I'm standing up for this conversation where I think you're sitting. I'm standing because I have to be moving. I can't sit. And then we have the Joker, which I can I can feel that you're a Joker. To, I am a Joker. Um, I you have you have the Explorer, somebody who likes to try new things, and then you have the director, somebody who likes to to plan and organize. All teachers by by nature are directors because we have to plan and organize our day. Um, but what we've done with those play personalities is we have also brought in the work of Dr. Anthony Benedict and his playful intelligence. So we mm -hmm. talk about that play isn't just a behavior. Play isn't just going outside and skipping or sidewalk chalk or playing basketball, but it's also play is a mindset. Mm. How, like if I have to go to the mailbox, how am I going to go to my mailbox? Am I just going to walk to the mailbox and come around and go back? Or could I skip and dance to the mailbox? Okay. Okay. Because I want to have some fun, right? And so play as a mindset is your approach to the things. So you have to do the heavy work, Sophia, right? But the mindset of which you approach the heavy work can change everything. And when you do it with that playful mindset, all these neurotransmitters are released into your body, to your brain. You got catecholamines, you got dopamine, you got serotonin, okay. you go. got neonephrine, you got all these things. And they all serve different roles in our body that uplift us. Mm. And I, I can't wait to talk about them at the conference because um, I get really excited about it. And I love to create moments to get all those neurotransmitters going. Because here's the thing. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world we live in is so heavy. Yes. It feels like it gets heavier every single day. You know, I, I've gotten to where I tried. I, I have to watch the news because I want to know what's going on. But I also don't want to watch the news because I don't want to know what's going on. But I have to watch the news to be informed so we can do our advocacy, you know. Um, so in order to balance that heaviness, I have been very intentional about bringing more play into my own life. Uh, I mentioned my third book, The Playful Life. Um, it is a book for everybody. It's not just a book for educators. And as part of me living my um, playful life, uh, that's where my little doodles have turned into stickers and stationery that are in my little Etsy shop. And, you know, I'm just trying to bring a little bit of joy um, and playfulness out there in the world in every, um, every space that I can. Um, and and I, I'm looking so forward to, you, you and I are gonna play together at the conference. I can't wait. <laughs> I am so here for it. I We're am here to. for it. We're and, going to. like, I mean, you know, as educators and as speakers, like our audience, like feeds off of that. Yeah, yeah they do. It's just so important to fuse in those moments of play and imagination and humor um, because it does, it does tap into different parts of who we are as individuals and it really engages the audience. I'm very intentional about trying to incorporate humor when I keynote because my keynotes and you'll see are like locked and loaded. And for a while I've asked myself, man, like, is this, is this too much? Right. Um, man, is this a lot? And I've, I've, I've really had to put away this imposter syndrome and really tell myself I'm a truth teller, I'm a storyteller, and I need to tell these stories. And many of them are not palatable. Many of them are not. And so that's why I have to be intentional about fusing in like, you know, and I'm with you on that, like this whole idea of code switching. I'm in a lot of professional environments, like here's something that I'm really proud of and that I'm kind of walking in. I've mm -hmm. recently taken a leave of absence. This is my first year out of the classroom in 15 years. Wow. And 
I've done a stint of higher ed as well. Um, I was an adjunct for eight years. I just left that role maybe about two years ago. I was in mm -hmm. a teacher preparation program. So I was training teachers. Um, and I, I've been out of the classroom for this entire school year. Um, and I earned entrance into a fellowship with the U.S. Department of Education uh, called the School Ambassador Fellowship. I'm not sure if you've ever heard, mm. um, but it's a national fellowship for teachers and school leaders. And it is a very difficult fellowship to get into. Um, mm. And I actually it got moved up a little uh, because of different circumstances, you know, when you work with a federal agency, you've got to roll with the punches. Um, and I start, <laughs> right. And I start my fellowship in the, in the fall. Um, but I am just really excited at the national and now federal level. Cause what, what I want to do with this message, um, is I want to impact policy. I, I want to, and not that I know very much about policy, not that I know, you know how things go in and out over there on the hill but you, you know you know things you know things i can right, tell yeah right but <laughs> but all of that to say i have the lived experiences i have what data is like i'm literally the data point you that, are the data yeah. that you are researching my students yeah. and their families and the issues that they're facing on a daily basis they are the research, they are the data points, and I have powerful anecdotal evidence that I feel should be in these power seats and really taking a national stage. And I have a lot of audacity to be able to do this. <laughs> Let me just tell you, I the got audacity. Some, I love it. I love it. Man, and I stay in some good trouble. Like, look, yes, the late John Lewis told us, come on now, never ever be afraid to make some noise and get into what? Yeah. Good trouble. Look, Come on you now. know, you, you mentioned you mentioned the ancestors earlier. If not for the ancestors making trouble, neither of us would be here. That's so true. Neither of us would be here. Not in no. our not in our present capacities. No. Uh, and I think that's important for us to remember. Hey, listen, I know we we gotta we 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 have a time limit. We're not we I could talk to you all day. I, I, could, I know we're we, gonna have to chat. We've got a time limit, so we've gotta we've gotta wrap this up. <laughs> um, both of us put our social media handles in on the screen. I don't know if I follow you on social media. So I'm going to literally take out my phone right now. And, and I hope that people watching will do it also. Take out your phone yes. and type in both of our names. Yes. Uh, Sophia Speaks, under, yes. Uh, underscore Sophia Speaks. Um, and then Mr. Derryberry, just find us both on your social media right now. Yes. And give us a little follow when you watch that. Oh, there you are, Sophia Gonzalez. And I follow you. I already followed you. Hello. You already followed me. You beat me to it. I followed you back. There it is. I'm following oh. you. I can't <laughs> wait for uh just to just to stalk you on social media and learn more about your work. And I hope everybody out there will follow us both and yes. learn about us both and connect with us. Um Sophia, it's been so fun talking with you today. Um I can't wait to meet you at Instoy this summer in Denver. Yes, likewise. Thank you so much, Jed, for your energy. You made my day. Um, this is what it's about for us to make these connections, for us to see each other. So I see you, Jed. Please don't code switch. Be sassy. Be you. Be Southern. I don't know what your combination is, what you call it, but we need it. Come I don't, I don't know what it is either. Because guess what? Miss G's coming through here. I go by Miss G and I earned that gangster status and I'm not That's code right. That's right. That's right. We just got to make sure, though, super quick, July 24th through the 26th in Denver, Colorado. Please register if you haven't already, if you're in the area or if you want to hear some incredible keynotes and breakout sessions, you want to hear our hearts on a platter, please go to nstoy.org, register there, nnstoy.org, register. I feel like it's going to be incredible. The, Nas the National Teacher Leadership Conference. Meet